Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Having a good time at, uh, at the summit? Yeah? All right, good. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Mehul Shah, and I'm the general manager for AWS Glue um, and a new service, uh, AWS Lake Formation. Uh, today, uh, I'll be talking about how you can build data lakes in a few days using Lake Formation. And in fact, at the end of this talk, um, you'll know how to use Lake Formation to create a data lake because we'll try to get it done within a matter of a few minutes. Uh, we'll be giving you a demo. And I have with me uh, our customer, uh, partner, and friend, uh, Srinivas Ravilisetti, know how to pronounce his name. Um, and he's from Alcon, and he'll, he's the head of um, IT analytics um, at Alcon, and he'll be giving you his story on how they built their data lake on AWS. All right, before we get started, I want to take a few minutes to talk about the trends that are driving this change into building data lakes, give you a few insights into what data lakes really are, why they're hard today to build, and then finally show you that you can build a data lake in Amazon on AWS very easily using lake formation. We're going to actually do it live. Um, and with me, I have um, our lead PM, Chanu, who's going to be running the demo. All right, so let's get into it. If you looked in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, most enterprises were building large data warehouses. Um, it was sort of the information hub around which decision making in an enterprise used to revolve around. Okay? Uh, these were structured warehouses of data, so mostly you know, columns, rows, and tables, very flat. And all of this data is coming in from your operational databases in your organization. Again, other relational systems or structured systems. And it goes through an ETL process where you combine, aggregate, um, clean that data, and then put it into uh, the data warehouse. And the ETL process is very centralized. And then finally, when all that information gets there, and it often took months, if not years, to set this stuff up, then you could use BI tools um, and reporting tools to get insights from that data to then run your business and optimize your business. Well, that's no longer the case. These data warehouses are still useful, but they're no longer the central hub for organizations. There's a couple of reasons for that. One big reason is that the data that enterprises want to manage no longer really fit in these data warehouses. Um, there's a lot more data, and it's just not cost effective uh, to scale these data warehouses for that data. Um, and the data is much more diverse. So now, you must know that in your organization, you probably have applications that are generating logs. You want to do analysis over those logs. Uh, you have customers that are looking at social networking feeds. They're looking at um, uh, uh, web clicks or um, you know, mobile um, uh, events uh, from your phones or from their customer base. All these things are generating unstructured or semi-structured data sets um, that are constantly evolving and changing. And putting that stuff into a data warehouse is also hard to manage. Across our customer base, when we're looking at our customers, what we find on average is that their data sets are growing uh, by an order of magnitude, 10x, every five years. And typically, when you're trying to put out a data platform that your organization is going to you know, leverage, you, wanna, you, wanna, you don't want to do it every year. You kind of want to have it last for a decade or a decade and a half. And so what that means is during the lifetime of that platform, it's going to have to scale from terabytes to petabytes. And these days, petabytes are almost the, you know, the you know, par for the course, and we're going to need uh, platforms that scale from petabytes to exabytes. The other thing that's happening um, is that you have more people that are accessing the data, more different types of personas. We're not just looking at business analysts anymore. We have data scientists, people building applications over real-time streaming data, um, scientific uh, 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 science users, engineers, IT admins, and so on and so forth. And they want to analyze the data in different ways, right? Again, we're not just doing SQL-based analytics anymore. People want to analyze the data uh, to do machine learning. Uh, they want to do scientific an analyses. Um, they want to do you know, short, quick analyses over real-time streaming data to get very quick results. So there's all kinds of things that people want to do that aren't just really amenable to what you would do in a data warehouse. 
And then finally, there are just a lot more rules around who can access data and when. There are regulatory um, requirements, GDPR, I'm sure everybody has run into one of these things before. Um, there are requirements and, and governance policies across your organization, depending on what level you're at and you know, what department that you're in. The good news is we have the cloud, the AWS cloud, and it's been a game changer. One of the things that you get is you get to choose which type of analytics engine you want to use on your data. It's not just one. It's not just a SQL um, data warehouse. You can pick a data warehouse like Redshift, still very useful, or you can pick Amazon SageMaker to do machine learning, or you can use EMR for doing big data analysis, QuickSight, Athena for just doing ad hoc analytics, and all of this stuff is available on demand and pay as you go. Um, the other cool thing about the cloud is Amazon S3. It's amazing what you can do with this thing. It's an ubiquitous store that gives you 11 nines of durability. What this means is you can actually finally centralize all your data sets, whether they're on-premise batch data sets or data sets coming in real time, streaming in from IoT devices, your applications, uh, video streams, whatever you have. You can put all of that stuff into Amazon S3. And now what you need is an efficient mechanism for organizing this information, for securing this information, and efficiently multiplexing this information across all the services that you're going to use to analyze that data. And this is what a data lake is, right? It's a centralized repository that enables you to secure, discover, share, analyze structured and unstructured data at any scale. A lot of people talk about data lakes as a way of democratizing data across your organization. There's no single bottleneck now, like an ETL process or an admin that has to give you access. And when that breaks, um, you know, everybody's down. Now it's really spread across the organization and people can pick it up as they need, pick up the data sets that they want as they need. We have on AWS more customers building more data lakes and doing analytics than anywhere else. Uh, I believe the, 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 you know, uh, the, the running number is like 10,000 or more data lakes on AWS today. And this is just a smattering of some of the customers, but we have thousands of customers doing this. But even still, with all the services that we have, building data lakes still can take months. Why is that? Well, let's take a look at the typical steps in building a data lake, okay? There's actually three different steps, and those three different steps are handled by three different types of users or three different personas. The one that you've probably heard about over and over again is the process of ingesting and cleaning your data to get into a data lake. Everybody has to do it, whether you're doing just simple analytics in a data warehouse or whether you're doing it in a data lake. The first thing that you have to do is you have to set up landing areas, in particular if you're going to do it on S3, uh, buckets, right, where you're going to put your raw data, um, and other areas where you might put process data and then optimize data for analytics. The next thing you have to do is you have to go identify all of your sources, whether they be structured databases, NoSQL databases, logs sitting in S3 or in streaming systems um, like Kafka and Kinesis and so on, and then you got to get that data out moved into your data lake, into your landing areas. And then after you've got them into your landing areas, that's when you actually do the heavy work of cleaning, combining, um, cataloging, and prepping your data so that it's optimized for doing analytics. Typically, this is done by a data engineer in your system, and they have access to various systems, um, sort of, uh, they have access to various systems across your enterprise. The next step is to actually secure your data and configure and enforce these various security and compliance policies that you have your, in your organization. This is also difficult today. And typically it's done by a data security officer. And then finally, you're gonna make this data available to a variety of different types of end users. I've labeled this person as a, as a data analyst, but the data analyst may have different access controls depending on what they do. As I mentioned before, data preparation is expensive. Here's a survey that was done by Crowdflower, where they looked at the time that it takes to prepare data for analytics. 
And what you see is about 80% of the work is going into just basically cleaning the data, okay? Uh, cleaning and sort of refining the data. What they didn't look at is the amount of work it takes, because they weren't looking at this in the setting of a data lake, the amount of work it takes to actually organize the data and secure it. So let's take a look at what that looks like on AWS today. First thing you have to do is find all the data sources that, that you, that you want to, um, uh, this is for setting up a data lake. You have to find all your data sources. In this case, what we're seeing are the Amazon RDS databases that this, um, that this account has. Then you've got to set up your landing areas in S3. And then you've got to set up policies on who gets to access what on S3. And in fact, what you'll see is you'll have to set up these policies in different places for the same set of users in different ways. And this can get very complicated. Over here is a policy that tells you what API accesses and what individual objects or what individual buckets that people can access. And these policies have limits on them on how big they can get. You gotta then map your individual objects into collections called, let's call them tables, and create a schema around them. And then you're gonna have to bring the data in. You're gonna use some ETL tool to do that. In this particular case, we have AWS Glue. And even in Glue, you're gonna need a developer that actually help, you know, looks at a script and gets it running. This is a Python script, or sorry, a PySpark script that gets it running to convert your data and load it in into your data lake. You're not done yet. You've cataloged your data, but then you're gonna to need to be able to secure the metadata as well around the data, the table, definitions, the schema, and so on. And again, these things are JSON policies that you express in the IAM language. Just wait, one more thing. You have to now go to the various services that you're gonna to use to analyze that data. This is a, uh, you know, a PSQL prompt that's connected to a Redshift instance. You gotta set up database users roles, and then make sure those roles have access to the various metadata and data sets sitting in S3. And then you get to do it again and again and again for every data set, for every user as they come and go, as their permissions change, and for every other service that's out there like Athena or EMR or QuickSight and so on. And as you can imagine, this gets harder and harder as you have more and more users as the kind of policies that you want to implement change. Um, and it's quite manual and trying to make sure that all of these things align sometimes can be extremely difficult. In some cases, you can't actually get what you want and you end up giving more access uh, than you want or restricting uh, people from getting access to data that they need. All right, well, let's show you what you can do with lake formation, which basically simplifies all of these steps and you can actually do it all in a single place. So we're gonna go and actually do a demo here. But before we get to the demo, let me give you the three main value proposition lake, uh, of uh, lake formation. The first thing is that it simplifies data preparation. It allows you to easily ingest data and get it prepared for analytics. And we do that with a feature called blueprints, and we'll show you that today. The second and main thing that it does is it allows you to secure your data in a single place in lake formation. And all of these various services, um, Redshift and Athena and EMR, um, can at, will enforce those security policies. So you don't have to configure it everywhere else in different ways. And then you can multiplex this data across all of these engines. And then the third main set of features that we provided is the ability to um, annotate your data sets and then search over those data sets so that you can discover, share, and collaborate across your organization. All right, so let's go over to the demo. The first thing that I wanna show you is how you can actually ingest the data um, inside of your data lake. So let's, um, and, and clean it. And so let's set it up um, uh, uh, on an actual account that we have in AWS that we prepare, prepared for you. The first thing we're gonna do is we're going to go and um, register a location in S3 as something that's going to be managed by uh, lake formation. So Chenu over here has picked a particular bucket, and that bucket is going, to, um, is going to be managed by lake formation as part of a data lake. Uh, what, he, what, we have, what he just showed you is 
all of, the, all of the users that are currently in the system when you hit audit location, all of the users that might have access to that location. In this particular case, there's no such users, so he closes that. And then he's providing a role. Uh, this role has the ability um, that you're passing to Lake Formation, so you're giving Lake Formation permissions, the ability to carve up this location and vend pieces of that location to various engines. So you need some set of permissions that you're gonna pass, and so that's what he's done here. Go ahead and hit register location. All right, great, there you go. The, uh, the location has been registered, and that's gonna be the landing area for the data that we're gonna bring in. And in this demo, what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring in CloudTrail data. Um, it's normally in JSON. We're gonna bring it in, we're gonna convert it into Parquet, and then we're gonna allow various types of users to just see different parts of that CloudTrail stream. CloudTrail basically logs all of the API accesses that your account has, been, has done or hit across AWS in a single place. All right, so um, now that you've um, added those locations, what you need to do is you need to, you need to give a, a principal, an IAM user or an IAM role, uh, the ability to store stuff into that location. So we're gonna do that with a very simple grant and revoked style pattern. Um, you see this in databases all the time, same thing. The role that he's gonna give access to is a workflow role. It's actually gonna do the work of ingesting. And the location that that role has access to is the bucket that he has already chosen to register in the system. Now these are different things. He registered the, the location into Lake Formation, so Lake Formation is managing that area. And he's telling Lake Formation, allow this particular role to use and read and write to that location, okay? So go ahead and grant. Okay, great, so now you have that role and it's already been granted. Notice there's no JSON policies. All you're doing is looking at the individual objects and granting users um, those permissions. The next things he's gonna do is he's gonna create a database, okay? Now, this is an important distinction that we've made in Lake Formation and in AWS, which is there's this decoupling that's happening between the storage and the metadata. So the database is the metadata. It's all the information about the, the, the objects that you have. The storage is S3, right? And so what he's doing is he's creating a database that's gonna to point to that location. You see this in other systems as well. And then after he's created the database, all he's done is point it to that location. Go ahead and create the database. Um, he's gonna grant that workflow role the ability to create tables in that database. So now that role is gonna be able to write into that location and then create tables so that you can query that table. It's gonna be the CloudTrail table. And what he's given is a bunch of accesses. If you go back to that real quick, just click on grant. Um, he's basically give, given a bunch of accesses that look like SQL-based accesses. You can do select, you can do drop, uh, you can do alter, uh, you can create tables. So again, it's not an API-based model. It's a model based on the actions that you would do at a, at, a, at, a, at a larger granularity across your data lake, okay? You can cancel that, because we've already done that. Okay, great, perfect. So now um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and actually use a blueprint. What is a blueprint? Go ahead, click on it. A blueprint, um, so we have a list of workflows in here. Um, a blueprint is basically a template. We've got a bunch of prepackaged templates already ready for you. We've got one for CloudTrail, we've got some for getting tables from RDS, um, various databases. We've got one for you know, ELB and ALB logs. Um, and uh, he's gonna you know, click on the CloudTrail uh, blueprint. Um, CloudTrail blueprint allows you to pick a CloudTrail trail. A trail is basically a sequence of API actions. Um, and then he's gonna pick the CloudTrail records um, or files uh, to go over for the particular day. Today is July 11th, so that's when the talk is. Um, and then he's gonna tell the system, uh, tell the blueprint where, what database to put this data into, what location to put it into, what format. Um, let's see what other formats are available. I think we have Parquet and CSV. Let's pick Parquet, because that's optimized for analytics. Um, import frequency basically tells you whether you wanna do it one time, run on demand, or you can actually do it incrementally, so you can actually keep running this over and over again. Okay, um, and then finally, um, he's gonna create a workflow. So what is a workflow? It's basically a, a, a schedule that includes all the things that you need to do to be able to get the data into the system. 
Now this is gonna be stamped out by the blueprint. So the blueprints create workflows. These workflows are actually in AWS Glue. Glue um, is the underlying platform on top of which LakeFormation is built. So what he did was he created a workflow. Um, the workflow has to have some permissions and that's why he gave that workflow the permissions uh, from that workflow role and in the behind the scenes, uh, the workflow is being created inside of Glue. Okay? Give it a, a couple of seconds, the workflow is gonna show up. Cross your fingers, it's a real demo. So make sure it shows up. There you go, there's the workflow. Um, you can see that there's a new workflow um, uh, at the top of that list, AWS Summit Demo, and it hasn't started, so he's gonna start it now. Great, now it's started, it's running. You can see the last status. So you can see the aggregate status of that workflow, like you know, uh, discovering your data or importing your data. Um, the other thing you can do is you can actually look at the underlying graph that that workflow um, uh, is composed of, right? And so now he's actually moved into AWS Glue. He's gonna go and take a look at that, what that workflow looks like. Uh, you wanna scroll up a little bit? And there it is. So you can see all the various actions that this workflow is doing. You don't have to go here. I'm just trying to open up the kimono a little bit and show you what's going on under the covers, and you can do it as well. Um, it's basically a sequence of actions. Uh, you're triggering um, various crawlers. Crawlers are going in, and I can tell you a little bit about them in a second, on discovering the data sets and their structure, and then we automatically spin up ETL processes uh, we know exactly how much, uh, you know, how much resources to use to be able to convert that data. Um, we then you know, run those processes and then you know, create those tables on your behalf in your lake, all behind the scenes for you. What you're seeing over here in the green is basically what's been finished, and um, the, the gray is basically all the stuff that remains. Okay, let's go back to lake formation. Okay, so while this is running, let's talk a little bit more about um, lake formation. Go ahead. You can see this status changed to discovering. Okay, so that was the demo, and in case that didn't work, we have backup slides, so I'm just gonna come right through it. Um, uh, we all prepared for this. Uh, so we talked about blueprints. The cool thing is that you can do this, you know, um, at one time or incremental, so these workflows can be run over and over again. This is, this is sort of a, an architectural diagram, uh, I should say a layering diagram for lake formation. The blueprints uh, mechanism is built on top of glue workflows, which are composed of ETL jobs and crawlers. I'll tell you a little bit more about what those things are. Um, and then all of the security mechanisms are actually built on top of the glue data catalog, um, and the data catalog is composed of databases and tables and columns, and that's gonna come in handy in a second. So let's take a look at some of the glue components, um, just so that you have an understanding of what's going on underneath. The data catalog that glue has, by the way, is the one and the same with the lake formation catalog. They hold the same state, okay? Long, it's a metadata repository, right? It stores the information about databases and tables. It's Hive Metastore compatible, so it integrates with all these various services. And it comes with crawlers, which automatically discover uh, the structure and layout of your data sets. We also have a serverless engine that runs um, uh, PySpark or Scala Spark scripts. Um, you can also give it just Python uh, uh, scripts and we'll just run not a cluster but a single machine for you. And you can do this interactively or in a bash fashion. And then finally, uh, we have a workflow system, an orchestration system that allows you to you know, create flexible um, schedules uh, uh, for running various jobs in a, in a complex fashion. And we have inter integrations with external services. Here's what the data catalog looks like when it's done. Okay, I'm not gonna go into this in the demo, but here's an example where we actually ran a crawl um, over uh, GitHub data. This is the GitHub timeline. And um, you know, no matter how complicated the data set is, in this particular case, the GitHub timeline is composed of lots of different event types and when you, you know, create a schema for it, you end up with more than 300, 350 columns. No matter, the crawler can figure all this stuff out. It picks up the main columns in the schema, and then you can double click into the different structures and see what those structures look like. 
Um, what's more important here is it also automatically figures out how this stuff is laid out on S3 in terms of partitions, so your engines can very quickly narrow in on the data sets and the pieces of the data set that they want to they query. It also give you, gives you some amount of profiling information about how big your records are, how many records you have from the sample that, it, that it's taking. We've taken the catalog and we've enhanced it in Lake Formation to make it more of a business data catalog. So what you can do now is search across your catalog using keywords, and this search work ac works across all metadata, including attributes that you specify on tables and on columns. So you can actually specify key value attributes per table and per column in that table, and you can search over all of these things. So it's very useful for putting business context in there. For example, you might want to record who the owners or the stewards of that data are, or where that data originated from, or where that column originated from, or what that column means. You might also even want to store information like the data sensitivity level uh, for that data. Is it PII data? Is it only meant for executives? Is it meant for admins? Is it meant for every user? And so on. And then, of course, you can query all this data, um, search through all this data to find out which data sets are relevant to you. So it really helps it make it easier to collaborate. Another cool thing that we've done is, um, as part of the Lake Formation uh, offering, is provide machine learning transforms for data integration. In particular, it's for finding, doing fuzzy matching or fuzzy deduplication uh, between, uh, uh, between data sets. So imagine, for example, you have a catalog of products and the products are not labeled exactly the same way. How do you, how do you find the ones that are exact, you know, similar or should be the same? It's kind of a hard problem. Programmatically, you know, you're gonna end up by writing a bunch of rules and those rules may or may not work. What you really need is something that looks like a human, looks at it and says, I think these things are the same. And that's what machine learning transforms do for you, these deduplication transforms do for you. So an example here is a, uh, a, a shoe that's built by, uh, sorry, made by Trask, and it's labeled um, on the left-hand side, I know it's hard to read, um, it's labeled Trask Men's Saddler, um, and on the right-hand side, uh, because this is a different catalog, it's the Zappos catalog, um, it's just labeled Trask Saddler. And, you know, we can look at it and say these are the same shoes because they look the same, they ha have the same types of, um, you know, colors that are available, they're in the, in the same range of prices, these two products are the same. But to do that programmatically is pretty difficult. And so what we have is a way of training transforms um, with your data set, uh, refining that training, um, and, then, and then running those transforms across your data sets. So first, you, know, you use the ETL tools to be able to combine those data sets. You run you know, our, our, our transforms to go and figure out where the matches are. It may or may not work very well, so what you want to do then is train it by giving it positive and negative examples, and then you kind of iterate on this over and over again. And all of this is now built into Glue using a set of APIs and a, uh, and a user experience around machine learning, okay? I want to dive a little bit deeper to tell you a little bit about some of the technology that actually, um, that actually supports these things. Uh, in particular for deduplication, you know, the naive way of doing this is to look at all pairs of records that you have in a data set, score those pairs, come up with some way of saying, hey, these things are similar, and the things that are similar kind of group them and say these things are the same thing. And those are the, sort of the three main things that you can do with, um, with our um, uh, ML transforms and three main things that you can control. But we, we actually developed this technology with Amazon Retail internally, and it's now available through Glue what we've done is we've actually given you a lot more controls and made this, these, this process a lot faster. So in particular, the first phase where you're trying to figure out what pairs to consider, what we do is we actually use locality sensitive hashing to decide which two records are likely to be similar and put them into different bins. And then in a particular bin, we consider all n squared possibilities. So we don't look at it across the entire data set. That speeds up the processing by orders of magnitude. And you can actually control how big these bins are and they vary the trade-off between how accurate versus how um, uh, inexpensive uh, the processing is going to be. The second thing that, that we have is a random forest model 
that actually creates these scores. And you can tune this model with GLUML um, with positive and negative examples for your particular data set. And then the third thing that we have is a better partitioning scheme that takes into account more than just the individual weights that you get from the scores to give you better precision or pres better recall. And you can actually trade off between the two. Recall meaning you know, making sure that you get find all possible matches, but you might have false positives. Um, or precision meaning finding only the ones you really are sure about, but you know, then end up with a bunch that you miss. You can tune all of this inside of GlueML. Main point that I want to make is there's a lot of technology that we've built in-house in retail that we've made available for you. If you use the previous sets of algorithms, you know, working over 400 million rows, 7.5 billion candidate pairs, it would have taken you weeks, if not months, to solve this problem. We can do it in a couple of hours. All right, let's see if we're done. Can we go back to our demo? All right, so let's go back to our demo. It's been done for a while, but it took a little bit longer than I should have. Um, all right, so what we're now gonna do is you can see that that particular workflow finished and it probably created a couple of tables inside of our database. Shall we go over there? All right, there's our database, the Summit demo. Let's take a look at the tables. We have some tables under, you know, starting with underscore, those are temporary tables, and then that's the main table that was created at the top. And then what are we gonna do now? We're gonna go and give permissions to two different users. Let's imagine one user is an IT admin that has access to everything in the CloudTrail data, and that IT admin is using Redshift. So we've created a role that Redshift will use to access that data. Um, we're gonna give it access to that particular database. We're gonna give it access to that particular table, and then it has all the columns, and we're gonna give it select access, but nothing else. So you can't delete or insert into there. And then we're gonna do a grant. Pretty simple, right? Okay, great. Now let's get another user, and let's imagine this is just your sort of average user that has access to the public information in CloudTrail. Um, let's call him an analyst, if you will. Same data, um, same table, same database, same table, but now um, they're only allowed to access a few columns. Let's pick those columns. Um, user identity, event time, event source, event name. Great. Um, and that's it. Now this user is going to go to Athena and is only going to be able to see just those four columns and won't know any different whether more columns existed or not. And we're going to give him select access to those columns. Okay? All right. Let's go over to um, Actually, now I think we want to switch back, right? Okay, great. All right, so how is this going to work? We've given access to these users, and we've given them both column level and row level access. I'm uh, sorry, column level and table level access, right? Um, the way this is going to work is the administrator, you just saw um, Chanu go do this process, they're going to uh, give access to those things. The users are then going to access that data in that data lake through one of various services. We mentioned two, Redshift and Athena. Redshift and Athena are then going to consult lake formation, okay, and then decide whether they're going to run the query and over what portions of the data to run the query on. And I've said this um, once before, and I'll say it once again. You get to control that data access in a very granular fashion with very simple grant and revoke permissions on tables as well as subsets of columns. And the nice thing about that is now you don't have to create all kinds of redundancy in your system where you create subsets of data just for the people that has to have to access them. And then as you have more and more roles, you have sort of an explosion of data that you have to manage. And because you're all do doing all of this in a single place, you can also audit all of the accesses to all of the data sets that you have in your data lake. How does it work? Um, you're gonna send a query, okay? User's gonna send a query for some table T. Uh, the query is gonna request access to lake formation for all the objects that are in T. Lake formation is gonna send back short-term IAM credentials that allow th these engines to access all of those objects, including all the columns. They're also gonna send back information about which columns that user is allowed to see. Then these engines Step number four, they're gonna request access to those objects directly to S3. Notice there's no intermediary between the engines and S3. So the normal processing that these engines do over S3 continues. 
and then these objects are returned whole, and then the engines themselves are actually doing the filtering. Okay? And these users can be IAM users, IAM roles, and if you're coming through EMR with Spark, um, your users can actually be Active Directory users and Active Directory groups, so you don't have to go through this federation process. Okay? All right. Three key takeaways, no intermediary in the data path, so your performance is maintained. The services are the ones that are doing the, the filtering. You don't have an extra hop. There's no extra cost in terms of networking or moving data. And then all of this stuff is done in a central place, so you can actually get audits of all the accesses. So let's, let's actually take a look at what, what that looks like. Let's go back to the demo. All right, so now we're in Redshift. Why don't we, uh, uh, have you already created the schema? Okay, great. Why don't we uh, run the query? So what this is doing is telling Redshift, hey, please connect, you know, create a schema for that database, meaning connect to that data catalog and create a schema around it. Oh, you need to restart this. We ran out. No problem. We can go back to the. <laughs> All right, let's just. Uh, while he's doing that, let me um, kind of forward through this and tell you another thing, and then we'll go back and finish the demo, okay? Um, the Glue Data Catalog and the Lake Formation Catalog are one and the same, okay? The state is one and the same. So your existing Glue crawlers, your jobs, your triggers, and your workflows, all your Glue resources that are governed by IAM policies, they will continue to work. You don't have to do a forklift upgrade to lake formation. What you can do um, is once, uh, uh, once lake formation, and once you are using lake formation, you can incrementally change the permissions on each one of your databases, and each one of your tables, until your entire catalog has gone over to lake formation. We did not want you to have to do a forklift migration, and so that's not what you have to do. Okay, are we back? All right, cool. Let's finish the demo. All right. Let's, uh, okay, statement successfully completed. He's got a database. Um, let's see what you can see there. All right, there it is. Let's take a look. This is the IT admin. And you'll see that the admin has access to many, many different columns. And then he can run a simple query over that, those columns. And you can actually run arbitrary SQL and ANSI SQL in Redshift, so you get access to everything that's there. Pretty cool, right? Let's go over to Athena. Now, this is your sort of average everyday user. Uh, they only have access to a subset of the columns. Let's take a look at the columns that they have access to. Those four that we decided at the top, as well as the partition columns, because those can't be hidden. Those are stored in how you actually lay out the data, and they help you actually locate the data sets that you care about, the subsets. All right, and then now we're gonna go run a simple query in Athena, and you'll see the results come up. The important thing is the Athena user, the average user, doesn't even know that there are, there are other columns in this data set, okay? It's named the same, it's the same database, but you only get a subset of the columns. Cool. And it's simple as that. Now let's go over to look at the audit logs. Here are the audit logs for all the accesses that we made. Um, it's all in a single place. The admin can take a look at it. And the individual um, accesses, you can actually look at the events. In this particular case, the Data Lake user was accessing the data set. Um, and you can actually see the select query that they actually ran. Cool, right? All in a single place. That's it. It's as simple as that to get a data lake set up using lake formation. You can do it in 40 minutes. So we already talked about the fact that you can do, uh, move the uh, data catalog from glue to lake formation incrementally. The pricing for lake formation, there's no additional charge. This is all basically the charge of the underlying services that you're using. Glue, Athena, Redshift, EMR, you don't pay for all of this extra functionality. You just get to use it. To conclude, data lakes are the evolution of data warehousing. Okay? Lake formation makes setting up, securing, and using data lakes simple. And we have loads more to come 
We're going to do we're going to do attribute attribute based or tag based access control. That business metadata will help you actually specify security policies using that. We're going to give you data lineage to be able to understand how data was derived from one to another. And then we're also going to add more ML transforms to detect things like PII data or entities like emails and addresses in your system. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Srinivas, who will tell you about the, uh, the data lake story that Alcon has gone under. Thank you. Thank you, Mahal. Um, um, one of the best demos I've seen. Um, I mean, I know there are always some features here and there, yeah, but yeah, yeah. great demo. Um, thank you, guys. My name is Srinivas Rabilsetti. I am the IT um, analytics lead in Alcon. Um, the reason I'm here is to talk about um, how uh, our data lake journey, but also talk about how we are going to be using lake formation going forward. Um, if uh, For the guys who are not familiar with Alcon, Alcon is uh, um, is a surgical eye care, um, contact lens and contact lens care product company. We touch millions of lives um, across the globe. Um, we have two franchises, surgical and uh, vision care. We, we rank number one in surgical um, uh, customer satisfaction uh, and also our vision care, vision care products are, um, are one of the most trusted. I think most of you guys uh, are, um, at least the guys who are actually wearing contact lens must have ha heard about Alcon. If you have not heard about Alcon, give it some time. When you age, you will see that you are going to be <laughs> knowing about Alcon because you see all the diseases on the right side that we work at. <laughs> so it's a $30 billion industry. We are a $7 billion market share. Um, again, um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to go quickly here because of the time, and I know you have a lot of questions. Well, there is a lot of advanced analytics capabilities that we use now. We invest um, um, uh, invest a lot of money uh, into artificial intelligence, uh, ML, and also uh, automation and um, connectivity uh, for speed of discovery. But also we have uh, some state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities around the world. And we have a strong quality assurance team that basically ensures compliance and integrity. I know in, in a medical device company, it is very important. So this is one of the key things for us. Now, one of the things um, I'm here is to talk about data lakes, but I'm just going to uh, talk about what my team does. So we look at the entire portfolio of all the data warehouses, all the uh, data lakes, data marts that are in the company, and we look at the platforms as well. So Tableau, Clicks, uh, you, know, you name it, right? We have around 16 platforms. So it's a big, broad, complex landscape. And there are different teams that manage various tools and technologies. Why, what is our problem statement? I think this is a problem statement I'm sure everyone echoes. The data is scattered. People don't know what to trust, what not to trust. And what Mahul was mentioning before, a lot of time is actually spent in preparing the data. It's a common theme across our company, everywhere I go. And we, we started looking at that and said, what can we do for that, right? Um, so one of the things that was key for us is also to bring in uh, data ownership, which is data management and also agility to uh, give us that um, uh, centralized data, trusted data repository. So our approach was to build something, uh, centralized data uh, repository, and also build in data management. Data management is very crucial. I'm going to touch upon that a bit, because we talked about the data lake. And you know, 10,000 data lakes, I'm sure there are a lot of swamps in there, like people swimming already. <laughs> so we're trying to avoid that. And in my experience, last five years, it's, been, it's not been easy to actually maintain a data lake. So what is, what is our journey, uh, what, what is our journey so far been, right, and where we are going? So we had a lot of, um, in the past, Hadoop um, uh, infrastructures in, our, in place, there are a lot of data warehouses, a lot of data marts, everyone creates their own data marts because everyone thinks they are special anyway. And there are so many servers. <clears throat> and forget about the security models. Everyone I touch has their own security model. So how do we handle all this? So AWS gives us that ability now because the platform is so much scalable. It, it helps us. It helps us to actually bring all that data together. The best part of bringing the data together is not just looking at, when you talk about AI, ML, it's not about just the depth of the data, but it's the breadth. You want to find answers from the data. 
not just knowing the problem and going to try to answer it. You want to actually look at the problems that your data is telling you. And that can only come from not just the depth, but also the breadth. So that's one of the reasons what we decided is our data is our data. And we wanted it to be on S3 so that all our data is segregated from the compute. So we have storage and computes completely separated. The reason we did this is because we had suffered enough with Hadoop, where our cluster just keep going, going, and our we are paying money every day. It's like Netflix. You know, it just keeps going on <laughs> every month. <laughs> so we decided let's, you know, let's uh, get a good architecture in place where we pay as we go. So we had that in place. Then we are using all the AWS uh, services as much as possible, and we wanted to get a consistent and simplified security model in place. So um, what is that we want? What does a user really want? A simple thing, a simple user, a, a data scientist, a simple analyst, what does he want? He wants to just look at what the data is out there in the company, do some, uh, pick the data, get access to it, and start doing visualization. But imagine the life of these guys. They go talk to 10 people, 10 forms, you know, go to different departments, finally figure out diff 10 different tools to even draw a small Tableau dashboard or a small click dashboard. In a small organization is a one story, big organization is another story altogether. How do we simplify that? So mm -hmm. our goal is that we actually give them the ability to simply um, be a simplified experience so that they can browse through the data and actually get the access and do the analysis that they need. And obviously, um, one of the key motto for us is we make the users, we, we make sure that people are spending more time in analyzing the data and drawing insights and not preparing the data. So we are using all the AWS services there. One of the things that resonates with me when Mehul mentioned is like it took years. I mean, I've been doing this data lake thing for almost three to four years now. And it always takes a year to implement any data lake at an enterprise level, minimum. But we can do it in a month. We have done a fantastic job. We have a fantastic team in Alcon. We consider ourselves as a startup company. So we have done a great job. We launched something in two months. But that's not sufficient enough. So that's where lake formation comes into picture. And I'll tell you why. So this is our architecture. The, the green box that you see is the foresight. You know, you can relate. It's site, Alcon. So our branding to Data Lake is called foresight. We have four different components here, guys. One is data management. As I told you, it is very important for us. And then lake formation is where um, we tend to, we want to go. Right now it is on all on S3 and we use glue. It's all in just store the data there. Visualization tools. Now just this is an indication. I'm not talking about these are the only tools. I wish these were the only tools, but they are not. If I put all the tools here, it'll be three or four slides, but that's a different story. Then we have all these data science tools and data preparation tools that we want to get. How do we get these things to work together seamlessly? Why do people have to go through so much of you know, technology, you know, you have to get certified in 10 things before you access the data? So we wanted to make it simple. You can see the data sources. There's a wide variety of uh, cloud data sources that we have. We have uh, on-prem data sources. We also have data that we want to give it to universities, where they can actually help us. Again, think about that, right? The, the cases where we try to work with universities, but it takes months to actually get the data to them, give them the infrastructure to actually work on a model. But I think this simplifies for, for, for us. OK, what is the complexity with the current model? The biggest complexity is S3 bucket policies. There's no way we can get the security at the data level without the security model being complex right now. And what we have done, we have done a um, lot of custom development to manage the security model. You may be thinking about why do you even need to do any custom development. Think about building something at the enterprise level. You have hundreds and thousands of buckets. You need to catalog them. You need to have data stewards. You need to have data ownership. Who is giving the access? How do you have to revoke the access? And all that stuff to manage that at the S3 bucket policy level is a nightmare. But we have done it. We know what the um, issues are, what the gaps are. But that's where lake formation comes into picture. So other part is, everything in AWS is great when you act, when you're actually using tools. Every, every day, every month, you know, all the, if you go to these expos, every time there is always new tools coming up. Now, how do you make sure that these tools are able to access the data easily? So we've come up with some model where we can get, get these tools to access the data, give the leverage to the user so that they can use the tool of their choice to get the data and actually analyze the data. And the limitation of, some of the limitations are the size. 
And then obviously other thing is when you don't have column level and other level of securities, it's, it's always replicating the data again and again, you know, derived data, data sets. So why lake, lake formation? Well, it simply, it just simplifies our, our security model. And you've seen that in the demo. I, it's, it's actually, I was really impressed the way it was, the flow was fantastic. It helps us uh, with that security model simplification. Data cataloging, I know a lot of people uh, may be thinking about what does it really mean about data cataloging? Why do we even actually do this? The get data cataloging for is business data cataloging. When, when we are in um, an industry like medical device industry, we need to know exactly what the data is all about. What are the compliance requirements, security requirements on the data set? Is it from a particular region? Is it GDPR? Is it GXP, non-GXP? How do we capture all that? Because in the past, it used to be in the documents. Now we want to bring that very close to the data. Now we've been using data management tools that are external to the data to manage this. But now with the ability to actually have business metadata, it's fantastic that you can actually query the data using these metadata tags. Imagine, you know, you only, you know, people cannot see data in a certain country based on a particular tag or a column based on a particular tag. It's great. And it's that the simple model actually helps us very much. So what does it do? When we build the data, data lake in the last two months, I was very proud of it that we built something very fast. But imagine we spend around 70% of the time just building the security model because it is complicated at enterprise level. This actually makes it much easier. Data lake, uh, lake formation makes it much easier for us. Security management, okay, you go live. How do you, can you sustain, can you maintain it? It's been very difficult to do that. Lake formation makes it very, very easy for us. The, the biggest problem is the custom code. You know, people just keep writing custom code to you know, adapt to the security models. So one of the things this does is it actually helps us reduce that data redundancy as I talked about it before. Glue catalog, uh, one of the things is, uh, just to touch upon this topic, what, do, what we have right now is a, we have a data management tool and uh, AWS. Both of them are sitting on the AWS, I mean, you know, it, uh, the data cataloging tool is also on the AWS. But our cataloging, business metadata cataloging is actually happening in the data management tool. What we do is we enforce all the security or we trigger the security from data management tools. It's great, it is working well. The problem with it is I cannot still pass a, a business metadata to my data. I mean, I cannot take it closer to the data because how does that help? User-friendly search, one, one example and also enforce security in future. So that is a big, big, uh, big thing for us. Uh, the best part, I think, I think, is the migration is very simple. You don't have to do much. And the tool uh, is going to work seamlessly, especially with if you're using Athena or um, ODBC drivers. It's much, it's very clean, easy. You don't have to do anything uh, at the user end. It just simplifies the whole thing. Thank you. <laughs> So we're, we're happy to take questions. Um, we have about another seven minutes left, so go ahead. What experience do you have bringing uh, federated data, you know, SAP, Salesforce, other transactional type data that are near traditional data warehouses into the, you know, the AWS data lake? You're asking me or him? Go ahead. I ask him. He's the one who does it. I just so, build so it. So it's, it's one of the, uh, I can tell you that it's one of our biggest challenges, but we do it now. Is the integration the best integration that we could have? No. But we do have SAP data in there, Salesforce data in there. We have direct integration. Salesforce is pretty straightforward because it's API driven. SAP is always um, a little bit more convoluted and complicated. So what we do right now is we still use traditional model of actually pumping the data into the data lake, but we do pump them into the S3 buckets and enforce security. The, the biggest thing, uh, just to touch upon that, uh, is because the finance data is so secure, our goal is that we have moved away from IT owning the ownership of any of these data sets. So when I talked about the data management tool, by default, all the data on the S3 buckets does not have any implicit access. No one has access. The only person who has access is the data owner, which could be a finance user or a SAP data owner, right? And he's the one who will actually give the access to the data. Did I answer your question? Yeah, so, and then a quick follow-up. Sure. Um, are you planning on certifying any other third-party EPLs or 
That's a great question. So right now, um, at the time of GA, uh, most of the APIs that you can use to access, um, uh, to access these things through lake formation are going to be internal APIs for these services. But our plan is to open up those APIs once we get some more experience and making sure that these things are secure um, and that they're in the form that we want them uh, for these third-party services. So the answer is yes, but it'll take some time. Okay? Go ahead. Yeah, it's a great, that's a great question. So do we have a roadmap for future blueprints? Um, so we're going to create more blueprints for other types of databases, uh, not just the, the four uh, main types that we have right now with our RDS. Um, we are also going to make blueprints programmable. So underneath the covers, these blueprints are programmable. Like we've actually built a bunch of Python that actually implements this workflow and all that stuff, right? And so. The idea is once we've gotten those APIs just right, and you know, we need a little bit of time to make sure that that's scoped well enough so that you can't break out of our security, right? Um, then what we'll do is we'll open it up so that you can build your own blueprints. And this way, you know, every organization is gonna have a slightly different data set, a slightly different type of format, a slightly different type of database. They can use the underlying glue primitives, which are quite flexible to be able to build your own blueprints, and then you can then serve those up to all of your customers internally within your organization. Make sense? Yeah. You, you mentioned um, the column level security. Do you have anything you wrote for row level security? Yep, that's uh, it's coming uh, shortly after. So that we'll be fast following with row level security where you're going to be able to do simple predicates over, um, you know, over the rows. The challenge there, of course, is uh, deciding what predicate language to use and to make sure that all of the various engines obey the same semantics around those predicates. And it can be tricky depending on the types of columns that you have, the types of data that you have. I've asked him that question at least uh, four or five times already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, how do you, after the, everything lands into the data lake and everything is there, what's the query mechanism? Is it like Oracle where you can test for it? Or any standard model is So what tools we use to query the data? Okay. So. Um, uh, the general, uh, the way users are using it is generally if they have to run SQL queries, for example, to analyze the data, they can go to Athena, okay? Yes, at the end of the day, yes, you're right, but it, at the end of the day, what happens is once the unstructured data is actually, you know, the insights are being drawn, they get converted into some kind of structured data, then it's, that's when we use Athena. But uh, our goal is, uh, again, um, I, we do uh, realize that not everyone is, you know, wants to, to SQL queries, right? So we do have um, um, all these tools. We, we make sure that all the tools that we have in our landscape actually work to the drivers that uh, AWS provides to access the data, whether it is, um, as I said, right, Tableau, Click, or Alteryx, or whatever that tool that is available. So, and, and uh, to that, I mean, we did have to create a couple of custom components, for example, to make that uh, seamless for the users. Okay. It's it's not it's not the same performance. So again, the the we look at it one by one, right? So the data provisioning when it comes finally, um, it could be again going back to a database uh, data warehouse. It could be, uh, you know, uh, let me step back. So we have different layers, right? We have raw layers, we have trusted layers, we have additional layers. The final uh, product could be a data warehouse at Redshift or some other uh, database. The goal is when we looked at all the data warehouses, we found that lot not a lot of um, uh, data warehouses, data marts, are actually used for interactive querying. There are data warehouses that are sitting that are running like maybe once a day a query to populate what? To get an extract into Tableau. Why the hell do I need a database and a server to do that? Wasting do uh, money for no apparent reason. We said, we don't need that. Let Tableau directly go to uh, use Athena query, get the data, we are reporting. Same thing with Click. Because think about the visualization tools especially. They have all in-memory in capabilities now. They want the data in their system so that they can give you the best performance. So that's what, 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 what we have done is we have eliminated a lot of data, data marts and data sources there. To your point, if a user is coming, if a sales analyst is coming trying to query, the performance may be not as good as what you would see in a data warehouse. But again, it, it, uh, case, we take it case by case. 
if that is a real requirement for a business capability, we will do it. We're not going to tell them, you know, this is the only way to do it. So, so we, are, we have time for one more question, and we can take follow-up outside. Um, go ahead in the front. Yeah, that's a great question, which is, you know, once you've put give it under once you've put data under lake formation management, is it possible to still use the S3 APIs to get access to the data? And the short answer is yes, you can get access to the data through S3 APIs, but now you're back to using S3 bucket policies for those accesses. Okay? So you're responsible now for securing those. So if you uh, you know have a bunch of policies in lake formation and somebody has a side channel through S3 that they can get access data through, then you've basically overcome all of the column level controls. Uh, some people, and we, we're not preventing you from doing that. You know, there's a lot of customers with existing applications on S3, and we want to help you migrate over, but it's not going to happen in day one. So in that case, we do allow you to just register, like we did, existing locations, and you don't actually have to do any movement. You can actually just run a crawler, and it will automatically create those tables for you and then do all of that work without ever having to move the data. I know some customers have petabytes of data and you don't want to move it. You don't have to, okay? Um, and you can keep that access alive until you're done moving everything over. Okay, thank you very much, guys. And if you have more questions, we'll be in, in the back. Nice job.